I'm Austin, and uh, I really like working with my hands. So I've been playing with the Arduino over the past couple months and have really, really enjoyed it. And I finally got a talk together, and uh, this is it. I've never given a conference talk before. I've actually never been to a conference. So I, I hope you guys... Um, I hope you guys like it. I, I hope the conference, or I hope the talk is a big bang and uh, um, works out well. I work for Pivotal. Uh, th I like thanking them. They, they're paying for me to be here and got me a hotel and everything. It's really nice. And if you ever want to find me, I'm on GitHub and Twitter at AustinBV. So first, what is an Arduino? So I assume a lot of people have heard of them but they don't really know what they are. They've never actually touched one or seen one or held one. So I have one up here um, screwed into the cannon, so you can come look at it after the talk. Um, but what they are is they're a single process microcontroller, meaning they're a small computer, but they only do one thing. And they do that one thing over and over and over again. And they take the shape and form, or they take a lot of shape and form. So that, that first one is the mini. It's about the size of a thumb. Then we have the lily pad, which is an Arduino that's designed to be sewn into clothing. It's waterproof, um, can be washed, can go scuba diving, do whatever you want. You have the Gigi Spark, which is a Kickstarter, which is about the size of a quarter and can plug right into, uh, plug right into USB. Arduino is all open source. The community is, is really, really an open source community. And the, the, the hardware on the, the Arduino is open source. The firmware is open source. The software that you use to program with your Arduino is open source. And they allow for a lot of different variations. But the main Arduino you'll play with, and the one that's on this Canon, is the Uno. The Uno is probably the biggest, but it's also the best for prototyping. So the Uno comes with everything you need to get started with an Arduino. First, you have your USB. You can plug right into a, plug right into a computer and put your, put your software right onto the Arduino without thinking about how to connect them. You have power so your Arduino can stand alone. You have the microcontroller, which is the processor, the computer that, that makes the decisions and runs your program. You have analog pins and digital pins. The analog and digital pins are your way of interfacing with the world. So what can you do with an Arduino? You really can do just about everything with an Arduino. People have done, done tons of things. I built a Canon. Um, <laughs> why not? People build rovers, skateboards, scary toilets, <laughs> displays, and Halloween costumes, all controlled by a single, a single microcontroller. They let you start working with your hands, seeing physical, seeing physical, physical things change from the software you write, which is really cool, because I've written a lot of software. I do that every day, but it, I'm, I'm tethered to a screen. And the Arduino has like, taken away my screen, and now I can just interact with whatever I want. Um, so I started playing with them, actually, to, to do some home automation stuff and, um, and just kind of like get, get like temperature controls or thermometers to work, turn on and off lights. Other, other people in my office have done, done similar things, like opening and closing windows or turning on and off fans. So you can really start like writing code that, that like makes your life better, not just your workday better. Um, how do you do this? Well, you use the Arduino IDE, which is also open source. The Ardu Arduino IDE comes with two main features. It's really a basic IDE, but mainly it has a, a verify and compile. Arduino comes with a lot of header files that let it give you a, almost a DSL for C++ to write Arduino, um, to write code for your Arduino. So it has a verify and compile um, button, and that will include all those headers and test your code for you, or make sure it can compile. And it has a console so you can make sure everything on your Arduino is working the way you expect it to be working. What this does then is after you, compile your Arduino, after you compile your code and you burn it onto your Arduino, it's permanently there. The second you start providing power to this little chip, I'm not going to point the cannon down because it's loaded, but the second, uh, the second you provide power to your Arduino, the, the program on it starts running and it's permanently there. You can keep replacing that program, but it's permanently there until you replace it with something new. So you have this one-way communication. Your Arduino ends up being standalone. It's isolated and it's small. It's really cool because you can start putting them anywhere you want. You can bury them in your walls, put them in your yard to control sprinklers, do whatever you want with them. But you have to write C++. I don't like writing C++. I hate thinking about memory allocation. I love slow boot times. Like, all those things are really cool. <laughs> um, so RAD is a, way to, is a way to start writing Ruby code for your Arduino, and it provides you almost the exact same functionality that you would have with the Arduino IDE, but in Ruby. 
So what does a rad script look like? It looks like this. It looks really, really simple. So this is Ruby. You set, you set a pin, 13, to output. You name it as an LED. And then rad gives you a little blink function. So what happens then is rad takes this sketch, which is what you call something you put onto your Arduino, and compiles it into C. And it ends up looking like this. Um, it's not pretty. There's statically typed variables and semicolons. And, and you know, something you don't really want, you don't want to play with. I can't dream in C. I can like start thinking in Ruby. And that's like one of the things I like about that software or think, like about Ruby. But Rad has a couple problems. One, it hasn't been pushed to in about two years, which means no support for um, Ruby 1.9, no support for 2. You have to downgrade a lot of the gems that have been updated because, um, that have been updated since then because they're not compatible anymore. And then debugging was difficult for me. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with C besides college. And so I had to think about how my Ruby code was becoming C and failing comp compilation in C and then come back to Ruby and figure out how to change that or change my Ruby code. And so there was this like extra uh, barrier impeding me. And so it was really tough. So why not think about it in a different way? Why not think about our Arduino as a service? So we'll just talk to the Arduino. We'll put all our high le higher level logic, everything that we want our program to do on a computer. And we'll let our Arduino do what it's good at. We'll let it start interfacing with hardware, interfacing with the physical world, reading sensors. And that, that's actually was like a pretty cool idea. So I started looking at how to do this. Now there's some problems. You have those three benefits of how you burn to an Arduino before, what happens when you burn code onto an Arduino. You're standalone, you're isolated, and you're small. Well now all of a sudden we're tethered to something. So we're no longer standalone, and we're no longer isolated. And if I'm, if I'm plugged into my laptop, I'm not really small anymore. Which, now, now I just may as well have a computer. But the Arduino does give you one benefit over a computer. You can plug sensors into it. It actually has ways to plug wires into it and start talking to proximity sensors or buttons or anything like that that you wouldn't do with your laptop. So let's try and get back to standalone, isolated, and small. Well, first, if we want to use a computer, there's the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is a small computer that can run Linux, Debian. Um, or actually, I think people have gotten a lot more running on it. But plug an Arduino into a Raspberry Pi, and all of a sudden you're standalone again. This thing is isolated. The power comes from the, the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi is small enough to tuck into your wall or bury in your yard. So you're now small and standalone again, which is pretty, pretty neat. In the case of isolation, I don't really care. Like, being plugged into a computer provides so much benefit for me, I don't need to worry about being isolated from that. And if I can get them both small and, and self-contained, and that's, that's good enough. Um, everything seems to be tethered in this world already, so why not? Why does my Arduino have to be completely disconnected? So I started playing with this, and I found that Node.js has really figured it out. There's a lot of Node.js libraries out there to start interfacing with your Arduino. Um, why did Node.js figure this out while Ruby is, seems way behind? Well, I think because mainly the Arduino's asynchronous and Node.js is asynchronous. So it's really easy to move between the two and start working with one with working for one with the other. So that provides a lot of benefit. Ruby is not asynchronous. So there are a couple Node.js libraries or NPM packages if you want to start playing with Node and, and your Arduino that are um, pretty good. Johnny5 is really good. It provides a lot of utility, but uh, it's mainly geared for robotics. So unless you're doing robotics, it, there's a lot of extra stuff that you have to worry about. It's probably not as important. Then there's Duino. Duino is the one I, I really enjoyed and it actually helped me learn a lot about my Arduino and get, get going with it. And they say exactly what I was thinking. Like, why not just let the Arduino do the low level stuff while the higher level stuff can be done in JavaScript? And that seems pretty good. So now what, what Duino did is took all the complex, pro complex problems, moved them up to a computer, and just put a small C++ library on the Arduino that you never have to read. Like, as a programmer, I don't want to read it. I don't want to think about it. It's a service. It's like talking to Twitter. It should just do things for me. I don't want to think about the Arduino. So they really did do that. They turned the, this, this node library has turned, the, has turned the Arduino into a service. So now we have message passaging between the two. And it works really, really well. It, you, you can start prototyping things almost instantly in a language that you love. But there's nothing in Ruby. So, what are we going to do without, without our favorite language, the language that we're all here to a at a conference for, the, co the language that we, we work in every day? Now, I wrote a gem. So I implemented what I thought Duino would do in Ruby. And I had a couple goals for the gem. The first goal was I wanted to do it the pivotal way, which is to fully test 
um, fully test drive and make sure that everything, everything is um, consumed by automated tests or, or uh, covered by automated tests. And that was really, really difficult for me because I don't understand a lot of the things that are happening between, between my computer and the Arduino and the cord and the, the low-level stuff. So it actually was pretty interesting to get into. And I will say the testing is, is lacking still. Um, there's not a lot of integration tests, integration level tests. The Arduino can test itself, but there's not a lot of that going on. So it would be really nice if this gem could move there. The other goals is I wanted this library to be really, really easy to extend. I wanted people, there's so many, there's so many pieces of hardware out there. There's stepper motors from tons of different companies, sensors from tons of different companies. All of them have a, a slightly different way of reading hard, or reading the physical world. I wanted you to be able to write your own library or write your own classes that build upon like, this, this base structure that lets you interface with your Arduino. I want it to be documented. Um, there's a lot of hardware stuff out there and it's just uh, at like the electrical engineering level of I can't understand. It's, just, it's too difficult for me. And I just like, I blank out and I get frustrated and then I normally just go outside. So um, I wanted people to, to look, at, look at this gem, look at the documentation, and be able to plug their Arduino into a computer and have a light blinking in five minutes. Um, and, and what really, really is good about that, I think is you, you don't hit this brick wall and all of a sudden you just don't wanna do this anymore. Because you, you're, constantly getting, you're constantly getting a feeling of moving forwards. So you never, you're never just stuck. And the documentation really helped. The zero startup time was also a big part of this. I didn't want you to have to like, grab your, grab your um, user dev to find your Arduino and like plug in the file and deal with IO objects. Like that's all stuff no one really wants to deal with. No one wants to think about how that stuff works, how streaming works, how, how all that stuff works. I wanted you to plug it in an Arduino and hit go. And that should, that should be it. And lastly, it better be fun. That's like the whole point of this, right? Like we, we program because we enjoy it. And so I want it to be fun to, to play with. I want you to really enjoy building cannons and shooting potatoes at garages. Um, so I began, I began development by myself. Um, and I decided I didn't want to write any C. Uh, so I stole, from, I stole from that Ecto Duino, the Ecto, Ecto's library, Duino, the C that he wrote. And I just put it into my library. So I want to thank him for writing a great, a great base for us, um, for the, you know, this Ruby gem. And uh, because of that, I was able to get, get bootstrapped in Ruby really quickly but I had a couple of problems that I faced. First, I'm synchronous. Ruby is stuck synchronous. The Arduino is asynchronous. And what I mean by the Arduino being asynchronous is you don't ask an Arduino what state a button is in or what temperature it is outside. The Arduino is constantly telling you that the button was just pressed. And so you have to be listening for the Arduino to tell you something. And it, in Ruby, the easiest way to do that is to just block. So you just end up saying like, oh, I'll just wait until a button is pressed down and then I'll do something. But if you wanna do this in a website or a build script or something like that, all of a sudden you're blocking you know, incoming requests. And that's, that's no fun. So the first thing I thought was, well, why not just copy like line four line, the JavaScript um, library that I like into the event machine. So that worked pretty well. It started to like work and I was getting lights blinking and bu buttons, buttons pressing and, and everything was pretty neat but it didn't really look good. It looked like JavaScript written in Ruby, um, which was a big bummer, right? Like, we want, we want our Ruby to be readable. We don't want it to be nested. We want it to feel like, feel like Ruby. Look at this. We have um, newing up a board, then when the board is ready, as soon as the board is ready, because when the board news itself up, which is the Arduino, um, when the board news itself up, it has to like do all this communication and handshaking. And then when that board's finally ready, we can send it a message and we, Yeah, we'll leave that off for now. Um, so we, we can send it a message, and now we need to wait for that message to like, say that it was okay, and the Arduino to say, like, okay, we received the message, and finally we can start a timer, and that timer will run in a, link, a loop, and we'll blink a light. So that's a lot of work just to blink a light. Like, compared to what Rad had going on, like, Rad was pretty, pretty simple for blinking a light compared to this, so I felt like it was kind of a loss. So I moved to Celluloid. Um, there's been a couple talks about celluloid. I think there's another one coming up, so I won't like, give you the, the real scoop on it. But it's, it was pretty fun working with. 
Uh, really, it just provided like an actor pattern and a way to like push these things off to the side and not think about them. And it, it gave me a lot of utility to, to like pull up dying threads or if an exception occurs, that was good. But there was also a lot of overhead. And as much as I like people doing work for me, like celluloid, uh, I didn't need all the extra overhead. So finally, I decided to roll my own event loop. So this actually gave me a, a, a huge win, which was that my, gen, my gem has zero dependencies. So when you gem install this, you get nothing else, which I thought was awesome. Um, you don't have to worry about making sure you're updated with celluloid or the DSL doesn't match. And the other thing that's really good is, is it provides a lot of control for exception handling. Um, the way celluloid handles exceptions is not always ideal for physical, like physical computing or hardware hacking. Maybe if my Arduino accepts, if I can't receive a message, I want my website to die. Like I want something real to happen. I don't want that to just like keep trying to spin it back up. And it's harder to do that stuff. It's harder to do that stuff with the uh, with celluloid. And it's rolled specifically for the gem, so there's a really there's a really nice DSL around the event loop and tacking things into it. But the same rules apply as with celluloid or with event machine. You never can block it. So. Um, it was nice to kind of get, get, that win out, get that win out the door and like feel like I, I actually had control over my own library. I didn't have to read other people's documentation. So then, how did it end up, how did it end up, um, I think it ended up really well. I was really surprised. Uh, I've never written a real gem that I wanted to open source before from, from scratch. And I didn't know how this would turn out. I mean, there's a lot of really good choices out there, but it turned out really, really well. So first, I'll just kind of talk about what it does and how you guys can get started with it, because hopefully, like, after this talk, you'll call up SparkFun, which is a great place to buy all this stuff. Call up SparkFun or Adafruit, and you're like, hey, man, send me an Arduino right away. I want it, like, tomorrow. And then you just start working with this stuff, because it's really fun. And uh, actually, SparkFun is right in Boulder, so it's like a 45-minute drive. If you want to get up there tomorrow, you probably could make it. Um, so the board. The, cla the board class is... The physical or the programmatic representation of the Arduino. So, what does that mean? It is the Arduino. It has pins, it has I.O., it knows how to talk to things, it knows how to read things, it knows how to send, it knows how to, to look at messages that are coming into it. It is your Arduino, just in code. And so, it, you can actually read through it, and it, like, the, the class structure ended up looking like an Arduino almost. Like you have like things that you can set pins up on and you have your microcontroller and your, your heartbeats and your loops and all that stuff that, that make like what your Arduino is, like it's, it's physical piece. And so that's really cool. So it really is like the heart of the gem. It provides all of the utility. It is the core. But there's one thing that it doesn't do. It doesn't communicate. And that was a really conscious decision. Um, instead, we moved communication into its own class, which is the TXRX. TXRX is a domain term. If you've never done hardware hacking, you probably have never heard it, or if you've never done, um, but what it means is, is essentially like sending and receiving of messages or um, input and output. So TXRX, if the Arduino, if the board class is the heart, then TXRX is probably the mouth. It, it's how you talk to the computer or it's how the computer talks to the Arduino. And so what that did, separating that out, gave us some really, really cool, um, some really, really cool features that we didn't see coming. But the first thing that TXRX does that's really important is it finds your Arduino for you. So it goes out groping your system and looking at all your USB ports and finds your Arduino and sets all that stuff up and tells the board that it, when it's finally ready. The other thing that we do with it is we inject it. So I've become a big fan of dependency injection, and we can talk about that whenever you want, but not, not while I'm on stage. But I, uh, I really like it. And by injecting this, I'm in no way coupled to my, my communication method. So if someone wanted to, they could write a TXRX class for Wi-Fi. So you don't actually have to be plugged in. So right now, if the Canon is, is plugged into a USB port on my computer, you could rewrite this TXRX, and as long as you adhere to the same public interface, then you can use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or infrared lights blinking at each other, like whatever you want. It would be really cool to do something like just crazy like that. And we wanted those possibilities to be open, so then eventually you're not tethered to your computer anymore and you're standalone again, um, which would be really, really neat. So why not? 
I mean, I'll, I'll accept pull requests. By the way, this is an open source gem. I want people to contribute. Um, just like the, the Arduino community is extremely open source friendly, um, if, you, if you submit pull requests, I'll, I'll take them, and then I'll just give you push access to the gem. Um, so as long as, you're a as long as you want to contribute, you can always contribute. So now all this stuff, those two classes that I talked about are really low level, and you might never even have to open them up. They deal with IO objects and, and non-blocking and have event loops buried in, into the depths of them, and they're, they're like really like the guts of what makes this happen. But if you don't want to think about that, then don't panic, because there's a bunch of other stuff that are part, there's a bunch of other things that are part of this gem that really like will help you um, start working with your Arduino and not have to think about the core or the base or the low level stuff. And that's all in module components. So module components is where we got that, where we got that benefit of easy to, expand, easy to extend. So everything in the module components extends base component. Base component does a whole bunch of little bits, or does a little bit of work for you, setting up pins, making sure the board is there, um, knowing if it's an input or an output device or whatever you really need. So if you write your own, just inherit from that and you'll get a lot of free stuff done for you. So let's talk about a couple of the classes that, that you can use tonight or tomorrow when you go get your Arduino from SparkFun. Um, you can use, you can start working with an LED. The LED is your hello world for physical computing. Like turn, blinking an LED is it. Like that, now you've, you've finally gotten like something happening and that's the easiest thing to do. So that was the first class we wrote. So what does an LED class look like in the gem? Like if you were to open it up and read the source code, that's it. Um, because everything is hidden so far into the board and all that low level stuff is pulled away from you, this is all there is to it. So you set your pin, you inherit from, so of, of course this is an inheriting from base component. So we call super on our initializer, and then we just make sure we're talking about an output device, and then we turn the LED off. So that's setting the pin to low. Then we just have two methods, on and off, and we can either turn the pin on or turn the pin to a high or a low. And in, in the, like the physical world, if you were to plug a multimeter into these pins, what that means is you're actually letting ele electricity flow through um, a wire or not. So it's actually like that, it goes down to like that far or low. And so that, that's been really cool for me, learning like how computers really communicate is, and, and building up on top of that. So this is what the class looks like if you were to write another LED class. You would get something similar, I think. But what's it look like when you use it? Looks like this. So it's smaller than the rad, smaller than rad. And all you really do is you new up your board and your LED. So you, t you new up your board and you inject your communication class into it. In my case, it's the TXRX or the, the serial port or a USB cable. And then I new up an LED and I tell the LED what pin I'm on and I give it the board. The reason we're injecting the board, and, and we've talked about this a lot, but the reason we're injecting the board is Aaron Patterson just gave a talk where, about making salami and he was using not, a, a not Arduino um, chipset. Um, and you could actually rewrite the board to communicate with something that's not an Arduino and continue to use the components. And so that was one of our goals too, is so everything is not dependent upon what, what stands above it. Um, so as you get more and more high level, the low level things can be, can be interchanged as long as you adhere to a, a public interface. And then all you do is you turn the LED on and off. And it reads really well. It all lays against the left line of your, of your text editor. Um, it's not nested. It doesn't look like JavaScript with do's and ends. I think this ended up really, really cool. I was like stoked when I saw, when I saw this finally working. Um, and, it, and it looked so clean. Um, but it didn't solve, or it solves one problem, and that's talking to the board. So talking to the board is, is really easy because that's not blocking I.O. Sending messages is really easy because you don't care if those messages are ever received. What you really care about is when the board tells you something, when a button is pressed, when a laser line is broken, um, when something bends, your flex sensor bends or something like that. What you do is you want, you want to be told that that just happened. And that's where it gets difficult in Ruby and is really, really easy in JavaScript. So the first place we tackled this was with a, a digital input device, a button. So if you look at class button, what does it look like? Button class, again, inherits from the component base, but instead of setting itself up on a pin, it actually adds itself as hardware to the board. 
So it tells the board, hey, I'm here as a piece of hardware. You should be li looking at me. And the other thing that it does is it tells the board what pin it lives on. And then it tells the board to start reading on that pin. So the C++, the C++ library on the board can dynamically figure out what pins it needs to be reading on based on what hardware is added to the board. So that was something really cool is that you're not actually setting up your pins ever. If you look at the C++, you're not actually setting up your pins in like a setup loop on the Arduino if you, if you guys have ever used one. You're, they're dynamically changing um, as classes die or are born. And the other thing you do, so then, then you have this update function. And the board calls update on whatever hardware it's looking at whenever a state changes. Um, so in the case of an analog or digital hardware, the, the state change is really the only important part. You know, you're not constantly just reading um, information. You're just, you only care when the button goes down. You don't care what, you know, what, what's happening in between down and up. So it calls that with a little bit of information. The, the data in this case is a one or a zero. Um, it could be changed to something more meaningful, like a symbol, and probably should be. And then we call uh, button up and button down, which are callbacks. So those callbacks end up finally getting passed in to your class, and you'll see those in a minute. But first I wanna talk about documentation. So this is where things kinda get weird, and you have a little bit more than an LED going on, where LEDs, you kinda just drop in, and they work. Or even on, in the case of the Uno, there's an LED built into it, so you can play with like it blinking lights without ever buying an LED or plugging wires into anything. Um, so we wanted to make it easy for not only you to get started with this gem, but get started with your Arduino. So we created fritzing documents for all of the utility classes. So in the case of a button, it's really simple. In the case of a stepper motor, it's not. Um, but they're, they're all there. And the goal is that, you know, when you want to start working with your Arduino, you don't, even, you don't have to go Google how to plug all this stuff in and figure out what resistors you're supposed to be using or transistors or capacitors. Like all of that stuff just exists in, a, in an image file and a how-to with an example and a running script that will make like, in, in the case of a button, when you press the button, will console log something for you. Or in the case of a stepper motor, will spin a, a stepper in either direction, which you'll see in a minute. So the goal is that all of this stuff is really well documented. There's images to help, help people get started if you've never done this before. And, and example classes, so if you, your code's not working, but the example class is, or the example file is working, then you probably are doing it. You need to figure out a better way, or need to, yeah, practice, I don't, I don't know. So what does a button look like when you actually use it? You pass procs into buttons, lambdas, um, functions, into, into a button as callbacks. Now, you're starting to feel a little bit more like, like a, an asynchronous language now because, because now we have functions that we've passed in and we call later. They're not called right away and they're not, they're pa we're passing functions around rather than just calling functions on things. But I couldn't think of a better way to do this and if someone thinks of one, please feel free. Um, but what you do is you pass callbacks into button down and up and you can pass as many as you want in or remove them later if you want or whatever you want to do and when the button goes down, it loops through all those callbacks and calls them asynchronously and then in the, sa same, in the same case for up. So we make sure we, we keep all those callbacks in an asynchronous world so you're never blocking your, your main thread, your loop, or your website, or whatever's happening. That, that's, really, that's really like the core of your application. Um, and it ends up being pretty small. Like to get a button working, that's, I was pretty happy. Like that's four lines of code and, and it all, you're already blinking an LED. So we have the LED on and off and passing in and stuff. So that's, that's digital input. What about analog input? Now a lot of decisions can't be made for you, like state change. So that's actually a little bit more difficult. So we have a sensor class. The sensor class is another one of those core classes. It's really, uh, um, I mean, it, it works. You could use it for any sort of analog um, input device. It works really well, but it, it doesn't have like the nice like on off that an LED has or the button up and down, like those methods that mean something to someone. Instead, we have to deal in, in abstracts because we don't know what sensor you're actually working with. So what I hope people do is they take the sensor class and in the case of um, my Halloween party, I have little sensors around my yard and as people walked by, they would whisper to you, like Arduino would whisper like creepy things at you. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, extended, I extended sensor for the proximity sensor. 
So a proximity sensor, all I cared about was if someone was within a certain range, not the range changed. So then I could say like within and give it a distance, and the, the sensor class knows, now it has, now there's meaning, there's a DSL to working with a sensor on my Arduino. And I thought that was really cool. So that's, that's kind of how you would do it. So what does the sensor look like inside? The sensor inside looks pretty simple. It has the same update function as a button, but you're adding analog hardware, which tells the board that it needs to know about everything. Um, that's, that's one thing that, that's the one thing that different, that's different. You need to know about everything, not just state changes. And we start read. So it's, again, very, very simple. These classes are really small. I don't think we have a class over like 25 lines um, in the end. Like that's been a really big win, besides the board, which is fairly large. Um, but that has all the event loop buried inside of it as well. So when you, when you use a sensor, what's it look like? You just pass in when data received, you pass a proc into that, or a lambda or a function of any kind. And it'll call those asynchronously when data is received. And it passes data into the function that you're passing into it. So as you see, the proc takes one parameter data, and it will call, it will call that proc with the data that the sensor's reading. So in the case of a proximity, the proximity sensors that I was using, it gives you numbers between like one and a thousand. And those numbers between one and a thousand, a thousand have like a logarithmic curve that mean distance. So then I had to have some math about how to get the distance to mean like feet to me. But um, it was always called with the data that was getting received, or with the data that the sensor is, is seeing. So that raw data, and then I have to translate it in my class to something meaningful. Um, finally, uh, another pivot wrote the stepper um, class, which I use on the Canon. I, I'm really bummed, actually, it's right here. There's a little stepper motor. Um, I had this, this thing like full pitch control from a website so you could aim it at yourself. Um, and then uh, in an attempt, when it got off balance, the, the motor was, wasn't powerful enough to pull the cannon back up. So um, the way stepper motors work is it's four electromagnets and it pulses them to get a wheel spinning. And so actually you can provide more power to a stepper motor and it gets more powerful. Um, unlike a DC motor, which like that can't happen. But I provided way too much and I fried everything. I actually created a little fire. It was neat in my hotel. I <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's also a fun part about physical hardware is you end up with like cuts and bruises and burns. Um, <laughs> which is fun for me because, yeah, it, it's interesting. You actually can hold something. Um, it gets hot. And not, not just like my laptop. But, but be careful, please. Um, so what does the stepper motor look like? It's two methods, so step clockwise and step, step counterclockwise. So all it does is it pulses my pins, the, pulses the pins on the, on the motor just like you should to get the wheel spinning, but it's two methods. That's what, uh, six, eight, ten lines of code to get a stepper motor working. So that was, that was pretty cool. And if you go find a, set, a different stepper motor, it's gonna be about the same amount of work for you to get it working. So that's what I, I think like, was really neat is as, as you go play with different types of hardware, it should be easy for you to implement them in Dyno and then start working with them. So then to, to spin a, a stepper motor, we'll just spin it a full revolution clockwise and counterclockwise. So that's all, we, that's all this, this script does, is it just like, turns it around and then the other action. So that's, that's some of the stuff that we wrote. It's a, a quick overview. There's a ton more that we're writing, have written. I say we, a bunch of my friends have been helping um, make sure this is well tested and working. And all, you know, I've just had so many people that are, have been enjoyed it. I think everyone in my office has, has at least given some sort of input, which has been really, really cool. But we have a, a lot more that you can play with too as you start playing with your, your Arduinos. You can start working with infrared. Um, I have uh, been working on a foosball table app, so a website that take, keeps score for our foosball table that goes like with leaderboards, so you can register who you are, and then we know who the best foosball player in the office is. Um, and I use infrared, infrared light in the goal, and the ball breaks the beam, and that's how I know that a goal was scored. So we have an infrared sensor. Um, that's a stepper motor. Um, we have RGB LEDs, so you can change the color. You have a, a multicolor LED and we have servos. So servos are like, uh, are a motor that is just not close to as powerful as a stepper, um, but a lot more precise as well. Um, and there's, uh, there's even more than that. Uh, it's like hard to go into how much like has been in the pipeline and not pushed or been, been worked on and, and now has made it up 
and everything seems to be very well tested and really well supported. So I hope that like, it's really easy for you guys to get going. So what does this code really look like when you use it? Because I've been using it, right? So this is the, this is the build script for, my, for, the, for the gem dyno. So it runs the build script. If the build is green, I turn on a green LED. Otherwise, I turn on a red LED. So I actually like, have a little light on my desk that turns red or green based on whether or not um, I broke the build um, for the gem, which I think is pretty cool. Um, super nerdy, too. But what about in Rails? So Rails is, Rails is weird, or I guess just the web is weird, right? Because we have these long-lived classes. We have buttons and LEDs and boards and, and uh, communicators, TXRX, that live a lot longer than most of your models ever dream of living, right? If they're living as long as the board is living, then there's probably a problem with your web server. Um, because they should be born when the request comes in and die as the request goes out. That's not the case of a board. The board you want to be, the board you want to be able to monitor the world around it, even when requests aren't coming in and out. Because you might, maybe you want to, to, to use Aaron Patterson's live streaming or pusher or whatever to send information to people on your website about the current temperature around you, or he could use it for his his salami stuff. So I ended up, I ended up putting everything in an, in an initializer in Rails. Anything that was long lived lives in an initializer. Maybe there's a better place. I don't know. Um, if there is, or you have opinions on it, I'm always welcome to them. Um, just find me. But I've been a fan of Sinatra. So this is the code for the canon. That's it. Um, so to run the canon, all I do is I have one endpoint that fires the canon. And the canon is digital, is digital um, output. So it looks like, or it feels like an LED. It may as well be an LED. Actually, when I was building the, the stuff for it, I was using an LED instead of a cannon because it's way more dangerous to have a cannon firing on accident. Um, but this is it. So um, why not look at it? And, and first of all, thank you very much. So let's. Oh, it's over. I need a browser. So this is the, the website for the Canon. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a T-shirt in it. Um, disclaimer: I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the compressor could be turned on for number two. <laughs> Just kidding. I have to actually turn it on. Yeah, safety. There's there's an emergency shutoff valve. All the way in. So anybody who wants can go to uh, curry.local, C-U-R-I-E.local on your computer. And uh, you can actually click fire. Just don't do it while he's in front of the cannon. Um, <laughs> If you can get there, I don't know if the conference Wi-Fi is actually working. Curry, C-U-R-I-E, dot local, and then it's port 4567, sorry. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. 
All right, you're safe. I turned the valve off. The safety's on. Who's trying to kill my friend? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I don't. I hope not, at least. I made the website during the last talk, so. So now someone, yeah, feel free. <laughs> Last one. Yeah, oranges, sandwiches, potatoes, whatever will fit. Beers, breakfast. Uh, go to the. Yeehaw. The noise is pretty good, right? <laughs> so, so thank you. The gem is at austinbv slash dino. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.